Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for any Asians who might be uh, watching this session today. We are so happy to welcome you to this sixth session in a series of eight uh, that is looking at this theme toward the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula, creating the foundation for a unified world. Before we begin, I'd like to give a few practical uh, explanations so that everyone can enjoy uh, according to their language and to make the, the most of every opportunity they have for interacting with us. Concerning interpretation, um, the globe on the lower right-hand side of your, the band, the band at the bottom of the Zoom screen uh, is the is there's a globe and it is for interpretation. So if um, if you click on that globe, you can choose your language. So if you don't click on the globe, you will hear just as the speakers are speaking. And one of our speakers today will speak in Russian. So you will need easiest would be if you're English speaking to just click on English right away. And there is also translation into Arabic and of course, Russian languages for those who would need it. Also, there's opportunity for interaction after the speakers present. So if you have questions for any of our eminent panelists, please write these questions in the Q&A, at the Q&A icon. So not at the chat, but at the Q&A icon. And we will try to get to as many of those as possible, maybe having to combine a few of them, but please give us your, also your feedback in the chat. Um, this session today has been prepared by uh, one of the eight associations within the Universal Peace Federation, um, uh, the International Association of First Ladies for Peace, which was founded in Korea at the beginning of 2020, just before COVID hit the world. And, um, so our theme today that we have chosen is women in international peacemaking and reconciliation processes. There may not be an abundant of Korean experts in our region as we have searched far and wide, but we do have many, many examples of women's leadership that are bringing critical elements to peace processes that actually can be applicable anywhere. When the world looks towards Korea, hoping for this long awaited political agreement, we thought, as women often do, that we don't want to just wait for that political signing of a treaty. But how can we from afar bring vision, bring tools, bring hope to the people of Korea so that this can accelerate really the establishment of a true peace culture on that peninsula. We know the conditions for peace are multifaceted and we will hear more about that today, but nevertheless, much weighs on trust, even interpersonal trust. Trust at the highest political levels is also built on trust between individuals. 15 years ago, as I'm frequenting the uh, uh, sessions at the United Nations, 15 years ago, there were many who didn't even know exactly where Korea was located. But now I can see an incredible change. Among NGOs that I work with, there are many who are now participating in networks that directly support peace on the Korean Peninsula. Conversations bring increased understanding. Understanding builds partnerships and coalitions. And finally, public will does and should influence political will. We would be amiss to think that we cannot influence events and peoples on the other side of the world in this day and age. And listening in on some of the other earlier sessions over the last two days, I was astonished to see how when caring, smart, engaged people um, weigh in on certain topics, even if it is not their direct uh, you know, line of experience, what kind of amazing, creative, brilliant ideas can come out. So I hope we will do the same in our session today. 
Now I would like to give you a preview of our uh, speakers today and maybe just quickly mention them by name if uh, we have that banner to put up or, or not. Okay. Anyway, as each speaker uh, comes on, um, their bio will appear, of course, in the chat box. Um, and then, without further ado, I would like to um, I would like to begin by introducing our first speaker today. She will speak to us by video. She is the only one who will speak by video uh, because she is in Korea, actually, and uh, and could not join. Uh, at this time. Um, her name is Dr. Julia Moon, and uh, she is a former prima ballerina who applies her skills now as Director General of the Universal Ballet. And uh, since 1996, since 1996, and is also the, the chair, chairperson, chairwoman of the Sunhawk Educational Foundation. She also, um, with the same dignity that she would dance with and acuity, she stands now as the president of the Women's Federation for World Peace International. So um, please enjoy with me uh, the video that she has prepared, especially for us. Esteemed women leaders, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it is truly an honor and a joy to be with all of you today. On behalf of our co-founder, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, I would like to thank the Universal Peace Federation for organizing this International Leadership Conference 2021 with the theme Toward Peaceful Reunification on the Korean Peninsula, Interdependence, Mutual Prosperity, and Universal Values. I would also like to thank our prestigious panelists who will be sharing their insights with us today in this important session of the International Association of First Ladies for Peace for the European and Middle East region with the theme, Women in International Peacemaking and Reconciliation Processes. Perhaps you are wondering why this conference is discussing issues related to the Pacific Rim and more specifically, Korea. Last year was the 70th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War. This war took so many lives and loved ones, not only of the Korean people, but also of innocent young men and women who came from 16 nations, including the UK, Belgium, France, Greece, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Turkey, to fight for a country and a people they did not even know. Without their great sacrifice, South Korea would not be the prosperous nation it is today. Seventy long years have passed since the war, and yet still, Korea is a divided nation. Furthermore, the conflict on the Korean Peninsula adversely affects relations among the powers in the East and the West, making this conflict a major obstacle to world peace. Much of modern history has been dominated by Atlantic Ocean nations through military strength, colonization, and exploitation. Despite years of effort by the United Nations, this masculine way of maintaining power has not created lasting peace in our world. While advances in technology and development have improved standards of living for many, there has also been an increase of social alienation and anxiety as well as environmental degradation that is irreparably destroying our planet. Though humanity has longed and strived for peace throughout the ages, this self-centered culture of violence and dominance, starting from the individual and expanded to the national and world levels, tells us that there is something fundamentally wrong. The co-founders of UPF and WFWPI have devoted their entire lives the cause of world peace. Since Reverend Moon's passing in 2012, Mother Moon, as she is fondly called worldwide, has continued to pursue their shared dream of creating a world of peace. 
She brings together heads of state, first ladies, parliamentarians, religious leaders, scientists and scholars, media professionals, artists and businessmen to address the fundamental root causes of the problems of our world. Her message is simple and unchanging. We are one human family under God, our common parent, and the only way to a peaceful world is if each individual, each family, each community and nation lives for the sake of others with God, our Heavenly Parent, as the center. Two years ago, Mother Moon stated the following, Europe had to sacrifice a lot due to the First and Second World Wars. The conclusion was to establish the United Nations in order to build a peaceful world that can become united. However, because each nation is focused on its own benefit, they could not become one. Human beings need to change. When they come to clearly understand and realize that God is our Heavenly Parent, there will no longer be problems caused by human-centered systems. Father and Mother Moon understood the unique value of the Pacific Rim era, saying that we must not repeat the mistakes of the Atlantic civilization, but go beyond the self-centeredness of the past and learn to live for the sake of others, as implied by the word Pacific, which comes from Pax, the Latin word for peace. Our world needs peacemakers, and women are naturally suited for this effort because of their God-given feminine and nurturing qualities. Under the guidance of the founders, WFWP has organized an annual women's conference for peace in the Middle East for 25 years. This has provided opportunities for women from com conflict-ridden areas to get to know one another and to gradually build relationships of trust. Upon that foundation, they have discussed pressing social concerns and issued joint declarations that reached government and relevant UN agencies. WFWP has been active in over 30 countries across Europe. Since 1992, there are advocacy teams and leadership programs at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, as well as the UN Crime Commission and the Commission on Narcotic Drugs in Vienna. Conferences and seminars have been held at the European Parliament and national parliaments on a wide range of issues. Mother Moon teaches that the heart of God, our Creator, is not just that of a father, but also that of a mother. God is, in fact, our Heavenly Parent, and thus we are all brothers and sisters in one human family. She urges all people to respect one another as children of our Heavenly Parent. Mother Moon wants all women in the world to realize and know their own unique value. She also encourages us to focus not only on women's rights, but also to uphold the rights and well-being of all people, building healthy families with the foundation of true love centered on God. By educating and supporting one another, women leaders can be initiators of peace, practicing and living for the benefit of others. A notable woman who utilized her skills in the pursuit of peace was U.S. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Following her husband's death, she accepted an appointment from President Harry Truman to the fledgling United Nations General Assembly. She went on to serve as the first chair of the UN Commission on Human Rights, and she played an instrumental role in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UD. HR. Eleanor Roosevelt used her enormous prestige and credibility to guide the successful completion of the UDHR. After this was adopted, awareness began to grow that certain human rights are inherent, that they pre-exist and stand above the state and all forms of political organization. The International Association of First Ladies for Peace affirms and uplifts the unique and essential role of First Ladies in contributing to peace and development. Like Eleanor Roosevelt in her time, may each of you contribute your own special talents, your own prestige to this world in crisis. 
I sincerely hope that IAFLP can become a platform for First Ladies to go beyond regions and come together on a global level. Together, let us raise the consciousness of people everywhere in order to bring about a world of lasting peace based on interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universal values. We look forward to having a meaningful session. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Julia Moon, for framing the context of our event today, sharing about uh, our new association of First Ladies and highlighting the nature of the peace that is needed to actually bring the change that we hope for. Uh, I know she would have loved to be here in person with us. Um, I would like at this moment just to introduce by name our speakers, the speakers that will be later introduced to you uh, in more detail by our moderator. Uh, but we have, um, um, these women have served as heads of government. Uh, they have served in political bodies. Some have done more than one of those. They have held positions in the United Nations. They are scholars, they work in the security sector, in business, even performing arts. And when I looked at this, what we've, the amazing group of panelists that we've managed to come up with for this event, I was really thinking this is like a microcosm of culture of peace, that we could get such a diverse group of women concerned about peace, thinking on a similar wavelength to sit together and now talk to us and focus our energy somehow in trying to even influence this fledgling peace on the Korean Peninsula that is taking more and more of our interest. So first of all, our, um, our session moderator today is Her Excellency Anneli Yatinmaki. Um, also, we have a speaker, Her Excellency Naila Mwawad, as you saw on the screen, Honorable Elena Drapeko. Also, we have uh, Dr. Boram Kim. And as each speaker, as I mentioned, as each speaker speaks, you will, um, you will see their, um, their more detailed bio in the chat. And just to say a word, maybe a little bit more detail about the person that I will hand over this, uh, this panel to, uh, that is Her Excellency Aneli um, Yatinmaki, who I've had the pleasure of working with over these past few weeks in preparation. She was the first Finnish female prime minister. She has also served as chairwoman of the Centre Party and as a member of the European Parliament of Finland. And she also participated in the inauguration of the first International Association of First Ladies in Korea uh, a little bit more than a year ago. She will be our session chair, our moderator for the panel, but we also invited her to take a little bit of, a few minutes, take the prerogative to actually speak to us as a speaker because she had originally been invited as a speaker. So she will take the floor first as a speaker and then lead into her role as moderator. So Madam Yatimaki, thank you so much for all you've been doing to help us prepare this event and the floor is yours. Good afternoon from Finland, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to discuss with all of you today. Our topic, women in international peacekeeping and reconciliation process is challenging. And women are not so often seen and heard in this context, even if it's utmost important that we women are active and have a role in defining and shaping peace and reconciliation. As Mrs. Julia Moon told us in the opening remarks, all women in the world should realize and know their own unique value. To get peace in the world, 
requires that both women and men are included in the process. And actually, in many cases, they are. Not in the headlines, but in the long working process, in the schemes. They make very important work. My very, my very close friend has worked in ex-Yugoslavia, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and also in Ukraine. My other friend has worked in Afghanistan. There are thousands of women included in these peacekeeping processes. And today we have here three excellent persons who told us what they have done also. My own experience is limited, but I dare to say one important part of the peace process in one country. I know my own unique value, as Mrs. Julia Mon told us to do. We all know that all the cases are different. Still, there are similarities. In my work with reconciliation and nation building, I have considered the following three elements as the most important tools. First of all, the long history of the nation. To know and understand the history, it's the most important issue. The second tool I have used is cooperation between different authorities and with non-governmental organizations. And the third tool has been using myself as an example of a democratic society with understanding of equality, impartiality, and confidentiality building trust. According to UN, reconciliation involves building or rebuilding relationships among people and various groups in society and between the state and its citizens. Deepening on the conflict, reconciliation may be needed between political groups between different communities or ethnic groups, between citizens and the state, or a combination of these. For nation building, in addition to financial resources, international political will and time, the most relevant priorities are security of citizens, political reform, and strengthening legal institutions. The process is slow. Healing trauma, building trust, and enabling forgiveness takes a long time. And it is not done in headlines, but in minds, brains, and hearts. The way to reconciliate is to meet and begin to discuss. When I met the different ethnic and political groups in Sarajevo, it was the first time for them to meet and discuss. That was the starting point to get them at the same table. During this long process, they could be assured that nobody is going to lose anything, but benefit something. Dear friends, I could imagine that in Korean Peninsula, the woman should be included and could be included in the process. The proposed peace zone, a small zone of trust, a meeting place for women to discuss is an excellent idea. And step by step, the women in peace zone know their own unique value. 
and the end will be history. With these words, I would like to contribute this discussion and give the floor to our excellent speakers. And uh, first, we will listen First Lady, former Minister of Social Affairs, Neila Moya Wad, and I want to say, I hope I proposed it somehow right. And Neila Moabad is a board member of the National Commission for Lebanese Women. And I know that the situation has been difficult and is difficult, but Lebanon is a beautiful country. I visited the country two years ago when I was a member of the European Union Parliament. And I know that your country, Lebanon, has excellent women and men, and you have the future. And now, Neila, you can tell us some proposals, how to proceed. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm so happy uh, to be with all of you. Well, Lebanon that used to be fabulous and uh, 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 brilliant example of, uh, uh, of uh, maturity, of uh, knowledge. Of, we had the best uh, doctors and peace and we had everything. And now we are in a very difficult situation. <clears throat> Myself, I came to, to an active polit, uh, polit, to, to active politics because my husband had been elected president of the Lebanese Republic and he was assassinated 17 days later. And now the, uh, the era we are living, live, we are living, I um, know why he was assassinated because all this wouldn't have happened. Anyhow, it's fantastic to be with all of you. And if we want to really improve the world and the situation, the different situations, we have to push women to be in, the, in politics and to be very active in, in doing everything. In the years uh, 82 to 86, I was the only woman in parliament. Uh, as I was uh, saying before, uh, last elections, which was four years ago, uh, three years ago, we had 111 candidates. Now, not all of them, of course, uh, uh, were successful, but now we have many women in parliament, and I think the role is essential. Because if you want to be a good leader in the political world, it's not enough to be a good talker, a good, uh, a good, uh, an important person, but it's very important to be, uh, to have, to have, uh, 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 to be with the people, to be very much uh, 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 with them, to be, uh, to be uh, with, uh, to give them love, to give them love, to go and see them, to see what they want, to see, uh, to encourage them, what to do to reach their purposes. And uh, I think now it has been a lot of progress because as I said, so many women now are in very important posts in the Lebanese uh, institutions, but also in the local institutions in, uh, in so many places. And uh, I think that uh, uh, now we need them very badly because unfortunately, as I said, Lebanon is in a very bad uh, situation. And uh, we, I, I, I really rely on women to change the situation, to, to, to feel how important it is to educate their young, their, their children, 
to be open to others, not to have always discussions and disputes. And, uh, and now uh, that reconciliation and uh, peacemaking are, uh, are essential for a society and a nation, and it is going and, and uh, it's going to face now we are facing conflicts and struggles, and unfortunately, many interests of people who want to make money and they don't care about the people. This I will not say more because I'm revolted by what is happening. Anyhow, uh, uh, I, I want to insist on the fact that it's so important to have ladies meeting together, um, uh, sharing their own uh, or their experiences and uh, being accepted by charming responsibles and ladies. And uh, we had, I had to prove that to women in Lebanon that they have a lot of advantages because before they used to feel themselves that they didn't uh, they didn't have any advantage and, people, and women and men was not looking, were not looking at them with, uh, with, with uh, easiness. On the contrary, I proved that when they are together, they can do fabulous things and uh, they are essential for, uh, for the improvement of the society and, uh, and they are indispensable in implementing peace, because once they know this importance, they can work and they can meet together and, uh, and uh, they can do fabulous things. And now they have dis discovered their importance. They, have, they are discovering more and more the necessity, the necessity of having them in any case. And Politicians are discovering how important it is also to be, to be open to the people, to know what they want, to know it's not only uh, very often people think that it's very important to have a good, uh, a good uh, CV or something. It is important, but it's more important to have a heart, to know what the difference areas in your country are looking for, are asking for, and uh, uh, the NGOs are essential uh, for these things, and the, the, uh, the cooperation between NGOs and authorities also is essential. Of course, authorities very often don't, don't like too much NGOs interfering, but now they have been obliged to accept them because without the NGOs, and I'm happy that uh, we had uh, in, I, I, had, I was uh, the, the, the founder of the René Mawad Foundation, and we are helping a lot, many people, all, many people all over Lebanon, and the authorities have to, and are obliged to, to be, with us to try to put the real links uh, amongst the many NGOs because not to be repeated everywhere. And if you give food because we have these problems or any other problem, the authorities have to be there to tell the, to tell the NGOs that pay attention another NGO is being very uh, active here and it's better that you go somewhere else, etc. So uh, uh, there is so much to talk. There is so much to say that we can do a lot, lots, lots of things. As I said, when my husband uh, was assassinated, I was the only woman in parliament. Now, and I think I've, I have been a little active in it. We have so many women in parliament and the fact that we had these, all these candidatures was, uh, was essential. Unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Henshin had spoken about the beautiful Lebanon 
we are not in the beautiful Lebanon now. We are going very deep down the, the, in, in, the, in the worst situation, but it's important to stay, to remain, to, remain, to, to be in touch with each other so we can help Lebanon to recover uh, all, all what we used to be. And we have to convince the Arab country to again talk with us. And, uh, and because unfortunately we are being, uh, we are being boycotted a little bit. And uh, I don't want to make a speech for, uh, for what is, is, is to be done. I think you all know it much better than I do, but we never have, we should never leave hope and we have to be very confident, not only in ourselves, but in other women that are now very happy to know that they can have a, 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 a role, that they must have this role and they must uh, consult each others before it was, I'm very good, but my neighbor is not. No, we all have to benefit of each other's experiences and meetings like this one are very indispensable. And thank you very much because we have to know each others and, uh, and we have to share our experiences. And I wish very much that we could meet together, not only on, uh, on a TV Zoom, but to be together for one or two hours, uh, making the meetings very, uh, very live and very, very knowledgeable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your excellent words, Naila Moabad. Uh, it was interesting to hear that uh, you say that the non-governmental, that the states, they do not like non-governmental organizations interfering in the questions. I know that situation. I would like you to tell a little bit more about that. But before that, I think we must give the floor our next speaker, um, honorary Dr. Elena Grigorievna Drapeko from Russia. She is member of the state of Duma since 2003. And uh, Dr. Drapeko is also a Soviet and Russian theater and film actress. And uh, she has appeared in more than 30 films and television shows since 1972. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Я надеюсь, что мой опыт и опыт моей страны пригодится для того, чтобы установить мир во всем мире или, во всяком случае, его укрепить. Очень многие проблемы связаны с тем, что мы мало знаем друг о друге. Даже сегодня в условиях информационного мира очень многие люди не знают истории других стран. И из-за этого возникает недопонимание и боязнь друг друга. Если вы позволите, я немножко расскажу о, о роли женщин в России на протяжении тысячелетней истории, но я не всех буду упоминать, а только избранных, вот, и о том, как сегодня нам видится э, ситуация с участием женщин в политических и миротворческих процессах. Ну, женщины всегда принимали участие в международных процессах. Вот у нас в России первой стала княгиня Ольга. Это было больше, чем тысячу лет назад. В 957 году, это в X веке, она, княгиня с большим посольством, нанесла официальный визит в Константинополь, известный этот визит по описанию придворных церемоний, которые написал император Константин Багрянородный в сочинении церемоний. Ольга была основательницей того российского государства, с которым сегодня 
все имеют дело. Православного, христианского, она первая приняла христианство на Руси. До официального крещения Руси. После, в уже более поздние времена, на троне Российской империи побывало семь женщин. Они были правительницами страны. Самые известные из них – это, конечно, Екатерина II или Екатерина Великая в XVIII веке, российская императрица, но она была урожденная София Фредерика Августа Ангальцербская. То есть она была немка по происхождению. Но русская императрица, потому что приняла Россию в свое сердце. В период Екатерины страна наша значительно продвинулась в культурном отношении, было положено начало развитию национальной литературы, российской науки. Кстати, она, именно Екатерина II, заключила мир с Турцией, Пруссией и Англией, подтвердивший присоединение к России Крыма, Кубани и крепости Очаков. В начале 20 века весь мир узнал о великой женщине молодой советской России – Александре Калантай. Она была политическим деятелем, феминисткой и первой в мире женщиной, министром и послом. В истории политики России 20 века были и другие женщины, и самые знаменитые из них – это, конечно, времен Советского Союза министр культуры Екатерина Фурцева и первая в мире женщина-космонавт Валентина Терешкова, которая сегодня является моей коллегой и заседает в Государственной Думе в качестве депутата Государственной Думы. Теперь о современной политике России. Мы должны упомянуть, конечно, Валентину Матвиенко, которая с 2011 года единогласно была избрана председателем Совета Федерации, Федерального собрания Российской Федерации, и в 2014 году она переизбрана снова на этот высокий государственный пост. С 2011 года она является постоянным членом Совета Безопасности Российской Федерации, и в том же году она избрана председателем Совета Межпарламентской Ассамблеи государств, участников Содружества независимых государств. В результате проведенных президентом Путиным в 2007 году перестановок в правительстве, впервые за многие годы женщины заняли одни из главных постов в российском кабинете министров. Сегодня, вот на сегодняшний день, в правительстве России два вице-премьера, это Татьяна Голикова и Виктория Абрамченко, и один министр, это министр культуры Ольга Любимова. А также женщина у нас, председатель Центрального банка Эльвира Набиулина, уполномоченный по правам человека Татьяна Москалькова, уполномоченный по правам ребенка Анна Кузнецова, и все равно мы, российские женщины, считаем, что в отношении представленности женщин в органах исполнительной власти количество недостаточно. Наши исследователи уверены, что если бы в федеральной власти женщин было хотя бы 30%, социальная политика России выглядела бы совершенно иначе. Если говорить о роли женщин в вопросах мирного урегулирования и примирения, поскольку женщины в противоположность мужской склонности к силовым агрессивным решениям более склонны находить компромисс, выбирать пути договоренности, то вот в локальных конфликтах на сопредельных с Российской Федерацией территории организация ОБСЕ – выявила несколько неформальных инициатив, где женщины с обеих сторон играют важную роль. В качестве примеров можно привести переговоры о распределении гуманитарной помощи через линию соприкосновения враждующих сторон в Донбассе и о решении вопросов документирования детей из непоконтрольных правительств районов, Некоторые женщины также ведут конфиденциальные переговоры с ответственными лицами о местном прекращении огня, о поиске пропавших без вести лиц и оказании поддержки 
жертвам конфликта. Большую роль в обмене пленными между правительством Украины и властями непризнанных республик Донбасса сыграли две женщины. Это уполномоченная по правам человека Верховной Рады Украины Людмила Денисова и уполномоченная по правам человека в Российской Федерации Татьяна Москалькова. А вот уполномоченная по правам ребенка в Российской Федерации Анна Кузнецова и сейчас в эти дни курирует поиск и репатриацию детей-сирот из Сирии. Это дети, чьи родители, граждане Российской Федерации, воевали на стороне террористических организаций и погибли. После идентификации анализов ДНК близких родственников, проживающих в России, на этих детей оформляются документы граждан России, и они специальными самолетами вывозятся на родину. На сегодня документы оформлены на 122 ребенка И поиски в лагерях беженцев, в тюрьмах, в приютах Сирии продолжаются. Мы надеемся, что нам удастся вернуть максимальное количество детей в Россию, предоставить им медицинскую помощь и передать их родственникам, проживающим у нас. Существует целый ряд неформальных процессов, в рамках которых объединяются женщины из разных социальных слоев. Это женщины Молдовы и Приднестровья, Грузии и Абхазии, Украины и неподконтрольных Киевом, киевским властям территорий. Они обсуждают вопросы вокруг конфликта. Вот в одном из таких процессов принимают участие бывшая депутат парламента из Республики Молдова. В другом случае речь идет о трех женщинах на посту мэров молдавских городов, которые организуют диалоговые инициативы с участниками из Приднестровья. Благодаря своим социальным ролям женщины не только привносят в этот процесс свой жизненный опыт и информацию, но и делают его более инклюзивным и отражающим потребности людей. Однако все еще отсутствует связь между формальными и неформальными процессами. Как разумно сказала наша коллега Аннели Айтиминяки из Финляндии, спасибо вам большое за то, что вы это отметили. Мы это тоже отмечаем. Официальные власти не очень хотят прислушиваться к мнению неформальных организаций, а неформальные организации боятся и не доверяют властям. Нам нужно вот эту пропасть каким-то образом сократить. После начала сирийского кризиса, как вы знаете, вероятно, призывы к более активному участию женщин в переговорах были частично удовлетворены. В 2016 году канцелярия специального посланника ООН по Сирии учредила совещательный орган по делам женщин. Этот совет состоит из 12 женщин, представительниц гражданского общества, которые участвуют в качестве сторонних наблюдателей в переговорах под руководством Организации Объединенных Наций. В ходе каждого раунда переговоров они, совет этот консультируется со специальным посланником в Сирии, представляя обсуждаемые вопросы в гендерном ракурсе и вынося рекомендации. В совет входят представители различных политических, религиозных, и этнических групп. Причем некоторые из них поддерживают сирийское правительство, а другие поддерживают оппозицию. В современном мире, как уже было отмечено, конечно, роль женщин увеличивается, растет их участие в мировой политике и растет признание роли женщин. Как пример мы можем привести Нобелевских лауреатов премии мира. Самые известные из них – которых знают и в России, и во всем мире. Это мать Тереза и Малала Юзефсай, Эллен Джонсон и Тавакул Карман. Имена 12 женщин Нобелевских лауреатов э, премии мира навсегда вошли в историю миротворческого движения, и мы их помним и чтим. 
И, конечно, существует резолюция Совета безопасности 1325, и нам необходимо и далее предпринимать меры по ее реализации. Она создала нормативную правовую базу, позволяющую регулировать участие женщин в миротворческом процессе. Однако наше участие все еще недостаточно. Поэтому мы должны объединить наши усилия и разговаривать с официальными властями о наших правах. Спасибо. Мое выступление окончено. Благодарю вас за внимание. Жду вопросов. Thank you, Dr. Prapeka. It was interesting and important to hear that trust building is important not only at state level, but also in different communities, regions, also in these communities where the conflicts are frozen. So we have still much to do. And uh, maybe later when we discuss, you could tell some more examples at community level what to do. But now I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, uh, Mrs. Boran. Kim, she is a peace and development professional with extensive program and policy experience in the United Nations system. And uh, she has served in two peacekeeping missions in Timor, Lest and Kosovo, as well as in Palestine. And maybe what is most important, she has visited also North Korea, fact-finding mission, or you can tell, and uh, you understand the history of Korean Peninsula. So maybe, and I'm sure you have something more to tell us what to do to get peace and reunification in Korean Peninsula. The floor is yours. Please. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and good morning to all the distinguished panelists, moderator and the organizer, and also very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our audience uh, listening in from wherever you are around the world. It is very exciting to see such diverse and influential actors, particularly all women, here today together to talk about peace efforts, and especially in the Korean Peninsula. Today, I'd like to share some of my thoughts on the role of women in achieving sustainable peace in the Korean Peninsula in particular, both from a global perspective based on my extensive experience in the international arena, mainly as part of the United Nations system, and also a personal perspective as a national of uh, South Korea. I shall also clarify at the outset that I'm speaking in my individual capacity, not representing uh, the United Nations or uh, my current employer and etc. So firstly, I'd like to give some context in terms of the role of women in peace efforts globally. I will share my screen just to give some statistics. I think uh, in this group of panelists and audience, we have the similar vision in, in terms of importance of women engagement in peace processes. Uh, in the mediation processes and post-conflict situations, et cetera. I think I want to highlight more about what tools we can have to actually make a concrete uh, step forward. So actually I cannot uh, share my screen because maybe I didn't communicate uh, with the technician in, in, in advance. So I can walk you through. Um, first, uh, the, the area I'm most familiar with is uh, globally within the UN peacekeeping missions. In 1993, only 1% 1 of women were uniformed personnel in these peacekeeping missions. In 2020, 5% are military contingents are women, and 11% of uh, formed police units are women. So over the course of two decades, I think 
I mean, it's still very uh, tiny figures in terms of number, but I think the message we get here is quite uh, significant. Then uh, 20 years ago, as um, Dr. Drapeko mentioned, there is a Security Council Resolution 1325, Women, Peace and Security. We celebrated 20 year anniversary last year. So there are a lot of uh, highlights uh, about the role of women in mediation, prevention of a conflict, or peace building, peacemaking, and also sustaining peace around the world. Then nowadays, we have um, sustainable development goals, uh, or 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals. And um, sorry, I am multitasking, so I'll now excuse myself. So here, I, I, I believe you can see the screen I'm sharing. So yeah, and 17 Sustainable Development Goals, uh, it cuts across a wide range of uh, issues uh, that impact our life and also both developing countries and also developed countries. So it includes both North Korea and South Korea and surrounding nations. And particularly, we have to pay attention to uh, SDG number five, which is about gender equality. So based on this global context in terms of where women uh, come in uh, in global affairs, especially in relation to peace. Now let's zoom in to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you all are in the audience in terms of what's been uh, progressed in the Korea peace uh, negotiations, but I just jot down a few recent key events. So first of all, uh, in our current government uh, under the presidency of Moon Jae-in, in 2018, uh, after a long while, both heads of state met in person. Panmunjom is located in the middle uh, between North Korea and South Korea. So it was a very historic moment. And they had very collegial discussions and et cetera. Uh, then in 2018 and 19, there were two summits at the heads of states of level between the United States of America and North Korea, which unfortunately didn't result in any concrete positive agreements. Then we also have to bear in mind there, is, there are a series of international sanctions imposed on North Korea and North Korean individuals, political figures, and et cetera. And it's closely monitored in cooperation with the international community. Then there is also a special rapporteur designated by the UN Secretary General to monitor and keep track of the situation of human rights uh, in North Korea, which also we have a lot of role to play as women. But unfortunately, I hope all these efforts led to something uh, uh, more fruitful result. but still political negotiations between the two Koreas are on hold. But there are many uh, complexities around this. So uh, in this brief amount of time I have today with all of you, the question I'd like to pose uh, to, to, the, to other distinguished panelists and the audience is on the left. How can we position women to be considered a sustainable change maker in peacemaking and reconciliation processes? Here, I would like to really highlight sustainable, uh, the, the, the word sustainable, because I think every step counts and also all our efforts should, should be sustained in a medium and longer term. So I have, uh, uh, I I'd like to convey three key messages. Uh, it's really my own thoughts uh, from my perspective, from my uh, experience. Uh, it's about, uh, let's, um, we have a lot of great stories about women's engagement, the role of women at the grassroots level, community level, and also at the highest political level in leadership positions. I think these are really great to be kept track of and to be documented. So how do we move from this anecdotal storytelling to uh, a creating a more robust evidence uh, base. So I think, you know, it sounds a bit more um, um, academic or, you know, too um, institutional, but I think now can we create some, uh, a go-to place, for example, do we know the sex disaggregated data in terms of uh, med existing mediators, peace negotiators, all those technical experts that support any type of peace negotiations around the world or even in the Korean Peninsula? I was unable to find that uh, repository of data or information or knowledge and etc. For example, we often ask, oh, if a woman was leading uh, this negotiation in Korean Peninsula, would the outcome be different? 
I actually cannot answer to that question, yes or no. I wish and it's my hope to say yes, um, but based on, uh, are, am I able to present a concrete evidence based on you know, the history and legacy of the uh, role of women in these peace processes? Maybe my answer will be not so clear cut. So for example, um, I'm not sure if uh, some of you probably are aware, our former president uh, was a female, the first female elected uh, president, although now she's impeached, and these things change. This uh, course of action take a different turn. Uh, if you ask me as a South Korean, uh, my answer is probably uh, not so much because any peace negotiation is also carries a great deal of complexity, uh, not just gender aspects, but also political lines. She was more a conservative political party, which tended to be more anti or, uh, North Korea or, you know, uh, prone to stricter regulation or restrictions, uh, so to speak. So how can we look at um, through more research and analysis, okay, the role of women and also the surrounding complex elements in terms of political climate, also one's socioeconomic status, uh, and also the relations with the neighboring countries, but also, you know, new actors and et cetera. So I think these type of efforts needs to be made uh, further to be able to position women as a sustainable uh, change maker. My second message would be um, tailoring to utilize or apply existing international commitments. Maybe this comes from my uh, extensive experience in the international arena. Uh, of course, here, I want to be very clear that this uh, peace negotiation in the Korean Peninsula should be led by the two Koreas. That goes without saying. But also in this era of uh, multilateralism, globalization, I think the international community has a role to play. And instead of reinventing the wheels by creating, OK, how do we involve women in this uh, peace negotiation in Korean Peninsula? Let's tap into the existing tools, um, such as uh, Security Council Resolution on Women, Peace and Security, and also something uh, of a regional level. I think that's also uh, completely feasible and doable. So let's uh, bring more experts on these uh, topics, then uh, incorporate into the peace prepar uh, negotiations, preparations, and, uh, and the arrangements, and et cetera. So here, maybe I, I, I can say, you know, when we talk about the role of the UN in the <laughs> Korean Peninsula issues, it's mainly uh, about sanctions monitoring, human rights situation monitoring, which puts off North Korea. It's very difficult to uh, bring North Korea into the table with these uh, hard issues uh, and yet very important issues. So if we target more technically from the expertise of uh, uh, from gender or, you know, from women's experts, I think we can soften the issues so, so that there is a higher likelihood for North Korea and South Korea to be able to sit down together to talk. My third and last message here is women's leadership is to be a norm. Uh, it shouldn't be an add-on or at a certain level. Um, I've uh, heard and learned a lot about the important role of women's network at the community grassroots level to build a pros, uh, trust at the beginning of the conflict prevention and etc. But oftentimes, uh, how does that lead to? What does that lead to at the end of the day? Uh, according to the UN Women's Study I read uh, several years ago, um, 13 out of 14 or 14 out of 15 um, national dialogues around peace, uh, it concluded with uh, only a few small group of men making a decision at the top. So I think this still tells us a lot of, diff a lot of um, nuanced messages. So we have to make sure based on the robust de data uh, or evidence, and also within in line with the existing international framework, how the role of women is reflected throughout the peace processes and where it led, uh, leads to uh, more successfully at the end. And here also I'd like to add you know, the culture of valuing women's and men's interests, priorities, and contributions to the peacemaking processes and recon reconciliation efforts equally. Uh, it's not going to be uh, done, you know, over a day or a month. I think it's a long shot, but I think we should still uh, try. Uh, maybe based on what I heard uh, from other panelists and moderator today, 
um, it's important to create seats uh, for women. I think uh, it's quite, um, today in 2021, I think it's better um, acknowledged. But you know, my call to you know, those in the leadership position, both men and women would be invite women, keep inviting women, and then value what they bring to the table. Because I think even if you have a seat, if uh, their voices are not reflected in a concrete manner, also there is something we have to look at and work, uh, work on further. So my, I actually created this presentation because I wanted to show this picture. This is my last uh, sl slide. So this is the meeting of the presidential uh, top A's in the Republic of Korea. I mean, I, I could find this photo on the internet uh, taken on July, 2020. So it's not even council of ministers, it's a presidential top eight. So it's about, I counted uh, those sitting around the table, around 22 or something, but I could see only three women. You know, you can say, oh, now three women from zero, but you can also say only three. So, I mean, it's an important message for me uh, to see that when I see this picture, I mean, of course, you know, we have to use our imagination and, you know, there are other technical level people and et cetera, but, if this group of, pe this group of people um, are advising our president on peace issues, on many other socioeconomic issues, and you know, there is a really serious lack of women's voices, I think uh, it's time to take uh, further action. So on that note, um, I will stop here and then I look forward to getting some questions. Thanks, Porakim. Uh, you had excellent presentation, very much information. And uh, I would like to go back to the proposed peace zone, a small zone of trust for women. Uh, what could be the first steps? But I want to give you also time to reflect it. And uh, we go back to our first speaker and uh, I ask, her also a question, and I want to repeat it. Uh, uh, I must now try to find it was the question concerning your own feelings concerning that the states, they don't want to non-governmental organizations to interfere in the process. Could you a little bit broaden this question? And this was to uh, our first lady, former Minister of Social Affairs in Lebanon, uh, Neila Moyawad. My name is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's complicated, sorry. <laughs> Well, I was saying, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit sorry because there are some points, if, if you give me a few minutes, I would like to say that we always the private sector now, uh, you, you find lots of women in the private sector and they are very active in the private sector and in, in very high ranking positions, which is also very important for women in Lebanon. Second, uh, before they, they, what I said about NGOs and uh, government people, it used to be true that they were uh, not very happy to see NGOs putting their nose in uh, the problems. But now, you know, the situation is so bad in Lebanon. Uh, people are hungry, people are impoverished, uh, many people are leaving Lebanon. So now I'm sorry to have said that without saying that now on the contrary, uh, not the government, but the people who love Lebanon and who think about Lebanon uh, are very happy to have uh, uh, NGOs helping them because we, are, we, are, we had a dramatic, uh, meet, uh, dramatic revolutions in the streets and now, unfortunately, really the situation is so bad that they are happy to be helped by the NGOs. And uh, 
the second point would be also that the fact that women have such empathy for the people are also very helpful to uh, go inside the, 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 their wills and their, uh, what they need, what they want, and uh, what they can give us. So, voila, it's uh, now they are happy that they are here, but of, also on one hand, it shows how much uh, the our rulers are not being present on the ground. Thanks God, there are uh, <laughs> there are uh, these NGOs and they are fantastic. Uh, as you realize, I'm in the opposition now. <laughs> okay, thank you, Neila. And uh, now I would uh, repeat my question to Dr. Trapeko. Uh, and the question concerns the trust building uh, in communities and regional level. Could you please give us some examples? The floor is yours. Да, спасибо большое. Я в свое время руководила организацией очень большой общественной межрегиональной организации. Она называлась Духовное наследие Родины. Она объединяла патриотически настроенную интеллигенцию, поэтов, писателей, композиторов. И мы наладили связи с многими родственными организациями из других государств. Но в частности в Казахстане, в Алмате была такая же организация, как у нас. Так, я прошу прощения. Я руководила очень большой организацией межрегиональной, в которой было несколько тысяч человек, и это все были преподаватели институтов, вузов, артисты, писатели, композиторы. И мы проводили культурные мероприятия, которые мы проводили в разных регионах в том числе. Мы выезжали в другие города, в другие даже страны сопредельные, с нашими программами, в которых мы рассказывали о нашем видении мира, о том, так. Прощение это, наверное, какие-то происки злодеев. Не дают нам с вами пообщаться. Значит, еще раз начинаю сначала отвечать. Я руководила очень крупной общественной организацией, межрегиональной. Ее отделения были во многих территориях. И состояла она из нескольких тысяч деятелей культуры, образования. В нашем составе нашей организации «Духовное наследие» были писатели, композиторы, артисты, преподаватели гуманитарных вузов. И мы организовывали крупные мероприятия, которые объединяли интеллигенцию из нескольких стран. Регулярно в Санкт-Петербург, где я живу, приезжали гости, которых мы принимали, селили, кормили и делали большой концерт артистов, которых они привезли с собой, а также вели переговоры. Мне кажется, что вот такая форма, она очень яркая, потому что на нее, на эту форму, так сказать, реагирует весь город, вся территория. У нас были полные залы, когда приезжали артисты из Украины, из Белоруссии, там, из других стран, очень много из Казахстана к нам приезжали, и зал на 4000 мест был полный всегда. 
И мало того, средства массовой информации очень хорошо реагировали на наши инициативы. А инициативы носили чисто миротворческий, дружественный характер. Мы пытались навести культурные мосты между нашими странами, между нашими государствами. Thanks. Thanks for your answer. And uh, now we go back to Korean Peninsula and concerning the peace zone area, what possibilities do you see, what to do, and what are the obstacles? And I give the floor to our last speaker, who was the last speaker, uh, Boram Kim. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, so I think there are two questions I see also in relation to your broader question, uh, the role of NGOs, civil society, and also you know, creating a concrete tool where a women's contribution can be registered to conflict resolution as a tool. And so if I can say briefly about this, I think in my entire um, time period as part of international organizations, civil society, the role of civil society has been always greatly valued. There could be many, you know, differing approaches, tensions at times, different, you know, understanding and et cetera. But also please know that, uh, you know, I'm speaking in my <laughs> individual capacity, but still, you know, we cannot function or progress without partnerships with civil society or citizens, peoples in broader terms. So I still think, you know, there is a lot to do. And especially in Korea, since the political negotiations have been on hold uh, without much progress for many years or without much significant uh, different achievement, I think it's really time to take a different creative approach. And here comes uh, about covering different topics through, you know, arts. It could be about partnerships, uh, alliances between, you know, women's groups and etc. But the complexity around this is in the situation in North Korea. You know, in in different political system, you know, in communism, also, you know, it may be viewed that, you know, everyone seems to have equal rights. You know, everything, men and women, there is not much distinction, but based on the regular report publicate, public, published by the special reporter uh, on the situation of human rights in Korea, doesn't say so. You know, still in North Korean politics, the number of women uh, is pretty low. Uh, the only thing I, I observed in recent years is Kim Jong-un, the current leadership really trust his uh, sister. So she sat next to him during all these important summits. Uh, but I'm not able to say what that means, uh, you know, in terms of, of women, you know. So, you know, I think there's a lot of things to dig deeper. So definitely uh, any uh, data collection, credible data collection, information gathering with the, in partnership with civil society, I think that will definitely help, but also to create a, some kind of a, a database or registration or tool to document women's role concretely to conflict resolution, you know, it's a complex task in my point of view, mm. because you need to have a thorough methodology, you know, like, you know, in agreement with a number of different partners. Uh, there is a lot of geopolitical interest, especially in the case of Korean Peninsula mm -hmm. or any other conflict situation. So how do we uh, create a, a common tool that's acceptable by these different actors with different interests. So I think, you know, there, I'm sure there is a reason why such a strong evidence base uh, is missing these days because everyone takes a different approach. But I'm sure we can start talking about kind of common approaches in line with international frameworks and et cetera, or successful examples from the past, mm -hmm. then, you know, that's going to be a good step uh, to take as, as a first uh, step. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Kim. Uh, the question was very difficult and nobody has the right answer, but I think it's excellent that we have different ideas so that one of them will at the end give unity to 
South and North Korea. But I would like to give the floor now to, to our, our questions from publicity and the who is taking care of these questions and maybe saying some words is uh, Mrs. Ray. And Ray is a 19 year old CAP student from London and she's studying global health and environmental sciences and she's currently interning at UPF as well as working with Yacht and Student for Peace, Europe, Europe towards the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, you have listened to this discussion and maybe you want to say some words and then we will give time to, to more questions. But I want to thank all the excellent speakers and uh, I really hope that we have given some ideas, some concrete ideas uh, towards peace and reconciliation. And I am also sure that the day will come some day when we see peace in Korean Peninsula. Thanks all of you excellent speakers. And now, Ms. Gray. Thank you, Mrs. Yasin Maki. Uh, I'm not sure I can add much content wise, but uh, we're getting many questions from the public. So I've been collecting those. Um, so once again, thank you everyone for your talks. I'm not sure if you can see in the comments, but you're also receiving a lot of positive feedback. So that's nice. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, Honorable Mrs. Nawad for the first question, which is, what is your experience being the first Lebanese woman in politics, and what lessons have you learned that you would like to pass on to women wanting to get involved with relations between North and South Korea now? Hey, uh, well, uh, thank you for your question, but as I said, my case was a little bit different because my husband had been assassinated, but of course it needed a lot of uh, determination and courage. It's ridiculous to talk about myself like this, but uh, our uh, constitution uh, in the north of Lebanon, women were not highly considered. Uh, and when I wanted to go after my husband, they were not, very, very happy, I must say, not to say they are a little bit uh, bold. But I think that uh, two things are important uh, for women. First of all, I had forgotten to say in my first uh, questionnaire that it is very important that women uh, go, uh, are highly cultured, or not highly, but at least uh, go to university, etc., so they know what others are doing and they, they gain themselves uh, a lot of knowledge. But on top of that, they have to be self-confident and uh, uh, self-confidence is very important to show that we feel that we are very important in the process of having a real uh, country uh, uh, and uh, an important uh, uh, an important country that uh, where women as considered as well as men. So this self-confidence, even the speaker of the house, when they told me, we, I've never seen someone like, uh, uh, like you, very, uh, you like bat battling <laughs> battles and things. I said, of course, to be able to live with you. I was joking, but not very much joking. So it's important for women to show that they are capable, they are highly educated or educated. And now, unfortunately, in Lebanon, people have, uh, cannot go to school because they don't have any more of the money. And I forgot also to say that 
uh, Lebanese people in other countries are helping a lot Lebanon and sending money to Lebanon. To, to. But be sure that if you have a, a strong personality and you have an aim and you go to that aim, you will succeed. Thank you, Mrs. Mawad. Uh, the situation is a bit different, but I'm sure there's a lot to be learned by you. Your question in which difference? Did you say sorry? that to know? Ah, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, that's okay for now. Um, I'll move on because uh, we don't have much time, so I'll try and squeeze in as much as I can. So moving on to uh, Honourable Mrs. Drapika. Uh, as a woman in the arts, how do you view the role of culture uh, with the role of politics um, in conjunction with that and within the issue of re reunification of North and South Korea, which do you think is more important? Я надеюсь, что культура будет тем мостом, который можно перекинуть через границу. Общность языка, общность истории, общность традиций, семейных традиций, общинных традиций – это то, что может объединять эти два государства, один народ. Я считаю, что э, те вот э, крепкие семейные традиции, которые Корея э, сохраняет до сих пор, и которые, в общем, в мире сегодня не везде есть, это очень большая ценность. Поэтому нужно делиться тем, что у вас есть, новыми фильмами, новыми постановками, новыми артистами. Сегодня в мире интернета это не так сложно, но надо и слышать, Что же происходит с той стороны границы? Обязательно прислушиваться к позиции других людей. Как показала история, разница в идеологии абсолютно не, так сказать, главная причина разногласий. Потому что у нас есть много стран, у которых единый общественный строй, но между ними военные конфликты. И есть страны с разным государственным строем, которые живут в мире и согласии. Нужно научиться слышать друг друга и учитывать чужие интересы. Я преподаю в университете такой предмет, как методика ведения переговоров. Вот. И он говорит о том, что когда вы садитесь за стол переговоров с вашими партнерами, вы прежде всего должны обсуждать его интересы, а не свои. Только по пути взаимного учета интересов можно прийти к соглашению. И такое соглашение будет крепким. Потому что если вы стукнули кулаком или бомбой, пригрозили и добились на своих условиях соглашения, то ваш визави будет с этой же минуты, с момента подписания соглашения, искать способ его не выполнить. Об этом говорит наука. И я думаю, что это очень правильная идея. Thank you, Mrs. Jaffica. Yeah, I think it's very true what you said that um, if we're looking purely at uh, economical benefit or very practically, um, it's, it's hard to imagine the reunification of Korea. But I think what you said is really important about the importance of family in Korea and uh, the role of culture in, in uh, pushing forward, uh, improving those relations. So thank you for that. Um, I understand that, unfortunately, Mrs. Kim had to leave us early. So sorry for those of you who um, directed questions at her, but I think I'll just ask one more question. And it's a more general question. And I'd also like to invite um, Mrs. Yotin Maki, if you'd be willing to answer as well. And uh, going based off of uh, one of the last statements um, that Mrs. Kim made, we shouldn't have uh, women in just token positions within uh, parliament or within politics. So how do we change this attitude of having a, t a token three positions uh, within within a, a political system um, to changing the attitude to needing a balance between men and women and then not just being um, 
yeah, filling a, a token position. What do you think? Uh, if you mean that how to get more women in politics, I would like to say that it takes time. It's a question of attitudes. And uh, we know that attitudes, they change very slowly. But in the world, in many countries, there are also quotas. Uh, not so many concerning members of parliament, but, uh, but also concerning parliament members. But uh, maybe the most important issue is that women politicians, and not only politicians, but, uh, but we all speak that equality, equality is that both men and women are represented. And uh, nowadays, uh, there are many women politicians so that you who are young, you can see that it's not possible. In Finland, we have had female president and uh, she has said that because she was 12 years in office, there were small boys who ask, can a man become also president? So that uh, that's the question that if you see only women or only men, then young generation begins to think, or the children begins to think that this post is only for men or women. So that if there are both and, and we see that we need both, then during time, it it comes, but I don't mean that it is easy. There are many obstacles. There are many obstacles. And especially if you want to change something. And if you are the first one, first one, then the model is the previous models, they are different. If you are the first female, then all will look how the previous men did it. And if you don't do it just the same time, it may cause problem. And always there are also some people who think that politics is only for men, but those people are fewer and fewer. So that we work, we women, we must also work together. We must work together, share our ideas, our problems, and we must remember to, to give guidance to younger generations like you and many others. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really interesting point you made about uh, young boys <laughs> wondering <laughs> if they can become <laughs> the president one day. And I think it speaks to the importance of um, being able to hold that position as a couple you know, and, and that speaks to the importance of first ladies when the man is president and also first gentlemen when the woman is president. So both little boys and little girls can see that um, themselves in that position of leadership. Um, thank you for that. Uh, would any of our other speakers like to quickly add anything onto that question before I hand over back to our host? If not, that's okay. Um, we're, we're Can I just to... say a word? Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, women have empathy for the people, and this empathy is very, very, very important. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Nawad. Thank you, everyone, for answering um, our questions, and thank you to the public for submitting them. And I'd like to just hand over now back to our moderator for some closing words. Maybe I could, since we're a little bit short of time now, shall I maybe come in here? Um, 
Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, we, we can never know ahead of time how these events will go. And uh, I just wanted to say one word because uh, our amazing moderator, Mrs. Yatin Maki, she was referring to a DMZ project. A DMZ project that uh, actually would have been the topic of our speaker, one of the speakers who yesterday came down with COVID and whom we were really looking forward to hearing. Um, but there is a project that has been developed. It's called the Women's DMZ and Peace Zone Project. And it's a project that's being promoted towards the Korean governments and looking for part, broad partnership. And uh, some of the organizations that were involved with in organizing this, including the Women's Federation for World Peace, has been promoting this at the Human Rights Council in Geneva and other places. So um, I think this is something that um, it, it's a project that would bring, because there's one thing about talking about Korea and about the situation and passing on ideas, but there's another side of actually doing something there. So as Women's Federation and UPF both have our main headquarters in Korea, actually we are well placed to be able to, to, to really get involved and help others get involved. And uh, this Women's DMZ project is, uh, the idea is to actually have a place where women from North and South could meet together with the idea of building trust, creating projects, development projects, getting to know each other, breaking down you know, stereotypes and enmity. And it seems to be gaining a lots of momentum. And if anyone on this call finds it interesting, because in fact, our speaker, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Kim, who came in late yesterday afternoon as a speaker because the other speaker actually got COVID. She jumped in without, without even understanding exactly what she could bring in, but we could see as the Korean who has been to North Korea, she brought in really uh, very, very important elements to this whole discussion. And um, uh, as she was talking about the special rapporteur on the North Korea, DPRK, and in fact, he is a proponent of this project. So he has heard this project. He has been unable to get into North Korea. He has for some years been the special rapporteur of the Office of the High Commissioner in Geneva to North Korea, but that he's never been able to enter. So when he heard about this project of women meeting at the DMZ, especially first women from North and South, that could be sort of negotiated, he was so excited and he has been referring to it in speeches. So this is maybe one small substantive kind of outcome of this. Otherwise, I just want to say thank you so much. You have no idea how many people behind the scenes have been preparing for these events. Our moderator, Mrs. Yatin Maki, thank you dedicating time and all your knowledge and for, for helping to prepare this event and our amazing speakers. Uh, Madam Moawad and Dropeko and Mrs. Kim, all our translators, even we have people writing reports and there's so many different uh, people who are coming together really to make these events end well and, you know, and hopefully bring some future outcome and results. So thank you again, everyone. And now I would just take a second to actually uh, say to everyone that please, uh, if you want to learn more, there is another event coming up. Uh, Victor, maybe you want to show that on the screen. Uh, another event coming up later today at four o'clock. This is another one of the new associations, the Association of Art and Culture for Peace, the role of culture in the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula with uh, Mr. Armando Lozano. And then tomorrow morning, we also have another 9.30, sounds also very interesting, towards a Northeast Asian economic community, what can be learned from the history of the European Union. This is the International Association of Academicians for Peace, and then a closing session will follow. So again, thank you so much to our speakers, our team, our audience, and could the speakers stay on after for a photo, please?
So thank you so much and have a great day. <laughs> I guess, are we off? I don't know actually, huh? There we go. Okay.